come in with the news. There would be a mic for me, the announce mic, and there would be a mic for him, the program mic. And he'd sit on that side of the desk facing us. And when I was on duty uh, one night, he came in, and I told him that he used to, uh, if we were just following uh, what we knew as sustaining, like punch into the network and pick up an orchestra, some, you know, they were playing or something. But he could go over if he had a lot of news and everything. So I told him this night he couldn't go over. He had to quit on time because we had booked a commercial in at the tropical room of the Hotel Fort Des Moines. And oh, he was upset. He said, I got a lot of good news tonight. They, they told me I could. Well, I said, well, there's been a change. And so he started and uh, got to about a minute and he was still going strong. And I did like this. He shook his head and kept right on reading. And then I did this with him in half a minute and he kept on reading. And all of a sudden, I just had to push the button, which shut off his mic and said, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the news. We take you now to the tropical room of the Hotel Fort Des Moines. Boom. Pushed the, the, uh, my mic off, or well, pushing mine off, put program back on. But they hadn't had time in the control room to pull the plug on his mic. And with that, HR stood up, kicked his chair across the oh, studio. No. Oh, no. And then <laughs> he. Then you can't he, tell us what he said, right? Oh, no. <laughs> in fact, the, the, the thing was that being on program, the tropical, the, the theme music from the tropical room was coming through as background to him. So we found out the next day that the Des Moines police went to the tropical room, thought it was some drunk. They were hearing the music and the voice coming over with all this profanity, and they said, the tropical room, if you can't keep ordering here, we'll close this choice. <laughs> so I used to be like later years when he became a very stalwart congressman and tell that story down in his presence. <laughs> so, so they were doing a remote commercial. They set up a whole remote broadcast just yeah. for a commercial. Yeah. Boy. Well, no, a, the, no, the program was commercial. The, the whole program. Oh, the whole program. They were doing the orchestra. The tropical room that bought the time to promote the hotel Fort Des Moines and their, their nightclub and cafe and so forth. Incidentally, he was a great congressman. He was known as the conscience of the Congress. And he was one of the only ones I'd ever known that read all the bills before he voted on them. And wait for some staff member to tell him how to vote. <coughs> the children's program, and he said, I guess that'll hold a little. Yeah, right. <laughs> so but it happened almost every day. At some time or other along broadcasting day, there would be some goof up. Some mix up with them you know, on the air, something that people would do it because everything was live at the time. Why, like, there they went. My own was, I was once slated to interview Amy Semple McPherson. Great. Remember the. You're pretty young. No, I was going to say her name sounds familiar. Well, that much. was the evangelist out in California oh. that had her own temple and so forth. And uh, uh, oh, she, she used to, she was world famous. She would, when it came time for the collection, she'd say, and I don't want to hear any clinking. I just want to hear the rustle of paper. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, oh, she did all kinds of stuff. And then she disappeared for a time. And it was a great, so where is she? What has happened? And she reappeared, and there was talk that she had kind of gone on a little uh, couple of week party. And uh, she came to the morning. I don't know why they should ask a sports announcer to interview her, but I did. <laughs> and then suddenly she <clears throat> went into a fervent plea concerning the success of her meetings, and so I sat down with an announcement. And all of a sudden, I heard her saying good night to our radio audience. And I looked up, and there were four minutes to go by the clock, and I didn't know enough about her that I could put in the air and fill four minutes. So <clears throat> I did like this to the control room, which meant that a record ready. A big, sleepy kid in there that was engineer running gain on the program. He put a record on and 
put the name over there and nodded to me. In the meantime, I was saying, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude this broadcast with a note of St. Evangelist Amy Sippel the first, with a brief and a little transcribed music. I expected nothing less than the automobile. The Mills brothers started singing many of the moochers wedding day. <laughs> and of course, when that came on, it came on in the studio speakers. She heard that, and I want to tell you, when she went out of the studio, her mink coat was standing straight up <laughs> behind her. How long was she on the air? When did she go on? Oh, golly. Well, see, I'm talking way back there in the 30s, so I can't remember how long she was. She probably couldn't get away with doing all those things on the air today. There are more FCC regulations probably on solicitation of funds and so forth. Yeah, I don't, um, well, her services when she was there were broadcast. I'm trying to remember, she really had an operation. Did she have to solicit money for, pe for people in the radio audience? Did well, she no, support? not a thing like this interview. She, mm -hmm. she really had. My fellow Americans, during the past week we've been working hard to advance the Middle East peace process and to try to improve U.S.-Soviet relations. I met with our good friend President Mubarak of Egypt, and I'll be holding discussions this coming week with another longtime friend of the United States, King Hussein of Jordan. I hope to talk to you more about the Middle East next week, but today let me speak about our efforts to build a more constructive and stable long-term relationship with the Soviet Union. Both Secretary Schultz and I met with the new Soviet foreign minister, Eduard Shevardnadze, this past week. These meetings covered a broad global agenda, including the four major areas of the U.S.-Soviet dialogue, human rights, regional and bilateral issues, and security and arms control matters. They enabled us to discuss at the most senior levels the key issues facing our two nations. I told the foreign minister I'm hopeful about my upcoming meeting with General Secretary Gorbachev. And I put forward some new ideas as well as my plans and expectations for that meeting. The Soviet foreign minister indicated that Mr. Gorbachev also is looking forward to these discussions. Furthermore, we agreed to set up a series of senior level discussions between our experts in preparation for the Geneva meeting. Let's be clear, however, that success will not come from one meeting. It must come from a genuine, long-term effort by the leadership of the Soviet Union as well as ourselves. The differences between us are fundamental in political systems, values, and ideology, as well as in the way we conduct our relations with other countries. The United States must and will be forthright and firm in explaining and defending our interests and those of our allies. I went over with Mr. Shevardnadze Soviet actions in various parts of the world which we feel undermine the prospects for a stable peace, and I discussed with him the need for the Soviet Union to work with us seriously to reduce offensive nuclear arms. These weapons exist today, and there's no reason why real reductions cannot begin promptly. Finally, I emphasized the need for a more productive Soviet response to our efforts in Geneva to begin a U.S.-Soviet dialogue now on how to fashion a more stable future for all humanity if the research in strategic defense technologies, which both the U.S. and the USSR are conducting, bears fruit. Mr. Shevardnadze indicated that the Soviet negotiators will present a counterproposal in Geneva to the initiatives we've taken there. We welcome this. It is important that the counterproposal address our concerns about reductions and stability, just as we've sought to address Soviet concerns, and we hope it'll be free of preconditions and other obstacles to progress. We're ready for tough but fair negotiating. You, the people, can distinguish diplomatic progress from mere propaganda designed to influence public opinion in the democracies. All too often in the past, political and public opinion, and sometimes government policy as well, have taken on extreme views of the U.S.-Soviet relationship. We have witnessed sometimes a near euphoria over a supposed coming together, at other times a feeling that the U.S. and the USSR may somehow be at the brink of conflict. By holding to the firm and steady course we set out on five years ago, we've shown that there is no longer any reason for such abrupt swings in assessing this relationship. 
Our differences are indeed profound, and it is inevitable that our two countries will have opposing views on many key issues. But we've intensified our bilateral dialogue and taken measures, such as the recent upgrading of the crisis hotline, to ensure fast and reliable communications between our leaders at all times. Above all, I emphasize to the foreign minister, and will do so with Mr. Gorbachev, that the overriding responsibility of the leaders of our two countries is to work for peaceful relations between us. So what we're engaged in is a long-term process to solve problems where they're solvable, bridge differences where they can be bridged, and recognize those areas where there are no realistic solutions. And where they're lacking, manage our differences in a way that protects Western freedoms and preserves the peace. The United States stands ready to accomplish this. Much more must be done, but the process is underway, and we will take further steps to show our readiness to do our part. With equal determination by the Soviets, progress can be made. We will judge the results as Soviet actions unfold in each of the four key areas of our relations. And I will be reporting to you further as preparations for the November meeting proceed. Until next week, thanks for listening, and God bless you. So it's a good time for me to take this risk and try to learn. She still has some parental backing. <laughs> <laughs> it's worse than it's worse. I hope that. She is our housekeeper. That's great. Very good. Can we pose for a little picture right back here? Yeah. If we were a candidate, then I would be writing. <laughs> Thank you. We must see you. Bye. Thank Pleasure. you very much for your time. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Awesome. President, one more. This is uh, Frank Gerber of Walker. He just took over. He's in charge of all the setup. Play your case on the oh, for heaven's WRNC sake. in Raleigh, North Carolina. Well, I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> Real Randy privilege to be with here. Thank sir. Thank you very much. Okay.